Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and tuning in this weekend. My name is JJ Matai and I'm one of the worship pastors here at Jubilee Fellowship Church. I get the honor and the privilege of welcoming you to our online service here right now. If you're new here and you've never been here before or you're new, a couple of services watching, we would love to connect with you. We're not coming after you, we're not coming to your house. We just want to know you and connect with you to get you more connected to what's going on at our church. If you go to jfc.org new, we have a quick card you could fill out and you even get a gift in the mail sent to you just for doing that. What could be better than that? If you're part of this community at all in any way, we would love for you to be a part of our commenting during the service. It's a way for you to stay connected with other people watching online since you're not in the building, but certainly a part of the whole of the community. Finally, in every way and everything that's happening in our church, we just wanna draw everybody together in whatever way connects you. We have three easy ways that you could give to be a part of the bigger kingdom vision that our church has to share Jesus with people. So however you come here, however you want to be a part of it, we would love for you to connect with us, and I will see you at the end of the service. Did you say cotton picking? Is that <laughs> I did, uh, years ago, me and Terry did ministry together in South Carolina, and uh, he used to say, good honk. And he still does. And I found myself saying, good honk, all the time. So it's a good one. It's a good one. So thank you, Pastor Terry. How's everyone doing? Good. Well, I got friends here. Awesome. Uh, my name is Pastor Jake. I uh, just want to welcome everyone. We're in a series, uh, if you don't know already, called Hot Topics. And uh, part of uh, what we're doing is, is taking um, hot topics in culture today, hot topics that, that maybe the church doesn't talk about enough or should talk more about or that we should engage in. And uh, today we're going we're gonna to hit a heavy one, um, but I think it's going to be good. And uh, if you got your notes, uh, you'll see at the title, uh, I've titled this The Church in the Gay Community. Um, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> now, uh, this is, um, you know, a, a church you've been coming to for a couple weeks. Um, I, I recognize just bringing up this topic can bring all kinds of different um, things to, to the surface. And maybe, maybe you've been coming for a couple of weeks and, and you got the email and heard what we were going to be talking about. And you're like, oh, please don't screw this up. I love this church, right? Um, and maybe uh, you, this is your first time in here and you picked a great week <laughs> to, to come uh, because this will probably be one of the longest messages <laughs> as you've heard. Um, Remember your laughter 45 minutes into this. <laughs> but, but can I just say, um, in, in all honesty, there are some topics that we need to dig into. And, and I recognize in a room like this, not everyone is a geek and into the original Greek Septuagint translation. But, but when it comes to this issue, there are some things we've got to really dig into and really understand. Uh, because it's being defined in all kinds of ways, and it's important for us to understand, uh, one, what God says, and what is our part in this as well. Um, so if you've got your Bibles, we're just going to open up to the first, uh, our scripture and our text for tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, says this. This is Paul writing this to a church in Corinth. He says, or, do, or don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, those who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. That is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were made holy, and you were set right in the name of the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, and by the Roach, the Spirit of our God. Would you pray with me tonight, Father? I recognize in, in a room this size, I don't even have to bring it up. We all know that this is a topic that stretches probably into most families in some form or another, whether it's a discussion or there are friends or families that are walking through this and there's lots of questions, God. And uh, I pray tonight, more than anything, Father, that your, your spirit would be here. God, um, the same spirit that invited me, God, some 30 plus years ago, God, into an invitation to follow you, God, that, that, that invitation, God, I pray, would be here. 
that that spirit would be here more than anything. Uh, Jesus came to bring truth and mercy. May we find that balance today in this. In your name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Uh, Imagine with me that you're um, a young person growing up in the church. Your family went to church. You love Jesus. You heard about the scriptures. You know the scriptures well. And early on, as some of your friends start noticing at that age the opposite sex, you notice that something's a little different with you. That maybe you don't have the same interest in that or uh, your ears don't perk up as much and you don't think nothing of it, um, but you continue to do what you're doing until those feelings begin to grow more and more. And the more and more your friends begin to talk about the opposite sex, you start to wonder, I don't share those same feelings. But you grew up in the church and you've heard all the statements before and so you just kind of push it down and, and over time it becomes an issue, something you really wrestle with. And you go to church and you hear words like abomination and you hear maybe a joke or two and you decide, I'm not bringing this issue up at all here. And so you decide, I'm just gonna keep quiet with this and I'm just gonna wrestle with this myself. And you do well, maybe for a while, maybe even you kind of choke down those feelings and date a couple of the opposite sex and it just doesn't feel the same way that all your other friends are describing it. And at that point, without being able to talk to anyone, you go, what am I gonna do? Who can I talk to about this? And maybe it's at that point you say, I've gotta find a community outside of church that will accept me, that will learn about, that will understand me for what I am. And you leave the church there. Now, maybe that's a story you've heard before. Maybe it's a story you've experienced. Maybe it's a story in the church you've heard of, maybe even in this church today. This topic that we're talking about tonight has caused so much hurt and so much frustration and so much confusion and misunderstanding. And my hope and my prayer is that tonight that we can navigate this in the right way. That we don't utilize this in a way that we weaponize it in some form, but we have a open mind to approach this. As I began studying for this, I honestly just sat down with the Holy Spirit and said, Holy Spirit, would you just reveal the truth to me? Would you, would you open things to me? I'm coming with an open heart and an open mind. If I've misread some things, if I've misunderstood some things, would you reveal it? I want to understand it. And I read books on both sides of this topic. And I've talked with people. I've had conversations. Those that are close to this and those that are just debating and trying to understand some of it. There's a lot of questions that we have and many people have when it comes to to this topic. Barna Research pulled a group of unchurched people and they asked this question. What comes to mind when you think about Christians? And they gave them a list of answers, many of them positive and then some negative. 91% of those people answered with the number one answer, hates gays. And the number two answer close behind was too political. In 2008, Zondervan Publishing, many of you know this, they published many uh, Christian books and uh, Bibles as well, was sued for $60 million for what? Translating a Greek phrase as homosexual offenders. Bradley Fowler, who was suing, said that that translation caused him years of anxiety, loss of sleep, appetite, self-esteem, and the ability to reestablish any family bonds. Now, the case was thrown out, but that is probably one of the best things to illustrate where we are at in this place. It's led to a lot of confusion, a lot of hurt, a lot of hate, and can we just be honest, a lot of weariness. 
Maybe you're here today, you've dipped your toe in the water. Maybe you even read a book or two and you just got dizzy and said, man, this is, I don't even know, man, this is getting really confusing. So before we dig in, a couple things I just want to preface. One, if you were to give me a list of topics to preach on a Saturday night, this would probably not be in the top 10, okay? Much of this is a response to where we're at in culture and a response to you. We want to be a church that's in the middle of the dialogue, not outside of it. And that means sometimes talking about things that are uncomfortable and things that are hard to understand and things sometimes that we think we have a full understanding about, but maybe don't. With that, I understand uh, it's not you know, new to me. If you're here and you're not a believer and you don't come to church, I, the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, I understand, are going to sound nuts. They're going to sound crazy and insane. That's not beyond me. I understand that. At the same time, I want you to know that you're in a church, and I am a pastor, and we are going to look at the scriptures, and I'm going to try my best to pastor our way through this topic as much as possible. I also want to say that this is not my final word on the subject. By any means, I am not coming down from the mountain with two tablets saying, thus saith the Lord. This topic is complex and nuanced in many, many ways. And I understand that. And we're going to try our best. And I think what you'll find through a lot of my study, I think you'll hopefully walk out of here with a better understanding uh, and maybe see some of the truth that's in there. So uh, lastly, uh, a couple notes about language. Uh, If you dive into this subject, you'll realize language is a big deal. How we talk about certain things, how we reference things, we can really show uh, our uninterest in someone by using wrong words, okay? If you were to go to Israel today and talk to Jewish people and say, I'm a Christian, that would be offensive to them because of their history with Christians. A believer is the preference that they would typically want to be to reference you as if you're a follower of Jesus. So we want to be conscious of that. And if you dive into this subject, you'll learn there's a lot of language as we talk about the uh, opposing side, agreeable side, whatever you want to want to uh, call it. So uh, let's just get this out of the way. Um, some, here's some of the phrases that are pop- popularly used when addressing this, uh, this subject. The first one is affirming and non-affirming. Uh, affirming is saying that I affirm uh, this issue, that um, I agree with it, that um, you know whether or not God allows, uh, accepts, uh, it, it is uh, affirming that issue. Non-affirming uh, says that we, we believe that that is a sin, um, that it's not according to scripture. I don't want to use this language, although it's probably the most popular when it comes to this topic, uh, because I just don't like the word of non-affirming. I think it's a little too... There are some things I don't want to, with a broad stroke, label our gay friends uh, and say they're complete. There are some things I do want to affirm in many of our gay brothers and sisters. Uh, so I just don't like this language. The other one uh, is, that's used quite frequently is classical or revisionist. Um, this is kind of the academic bourgeois kind of <laughs> way to reference it. And uh, it's just a little stuffy to me. And uh, finally, you have historical and progressive. Um, this is where I think and where the rest of the message, I'm going to land with this. I think it's appropriate. Uh, on one side, you have the progressive and this side affirms um, that um, maybe, you know, that uh, the scriptures allow for this, accept this, um, that um, you can be an active uh, Christian uh, in sexual uh, activity, and that's, that's permissive. Um, the other side is historical. And I think this is important on this side because... I think there is something to, you don't want to throw out with over 1,960 years of believers just like me and you, some even, you know, more studied uh, in this issue uh, that have already landed for many, many of those years. This hasn't been an issue and there has been a teaching in it. So I I like this language and that's what what I want to use kind of for the rest of the night. So the first part of this 
you know, talk tonight, and, and I'm going to break it up into three parts. The first part is, how did we get here? Um, you know, we all recognize the culture we're in, and, and there's some thir- certain things on both sides, the historical and the progressive, that I think are important for us to know as believers as we approach this. And then the second part, I want to look at the scriptures. Uh, many of people will say, oh, there's a ton of scriptures that say, talk a lot about homosexu- homosexuality. And the truth is, there's only six. Uh, and, and we're going to dig into those. And, uh, you know, like I said, we're going to get into some meaty original Greek language. So for those of you that are into that, I'm sorry, but it's important as we dig into this because it, it does really determine a lot of what truth and, and some of the things that I think you'll see. So, and then the last part I want to answer in, in the, as we close is how do we, how do we move forward as those that love Jesus? Like, how, how do we do this? Because that's a lot of the question that I get when I talk to those that are uh, Christ followers and in the church is, is how, do, how do we navigate this? So uh, first, I, I want to talk about the um, first, uh, how did we get here? Because it is tough. It's confusing. On one side, you have the progressive. And on the progressive, uh, when you lean heavy on this, you'll find throughout history, it's a big emphasis on justice, Right? On, and, and this isn't a surprise, especially in America, because we were founded on this idea of individuality, on uh, rights and freedoms. And so when you talk about the early days of the gay movement, um, it's easy to understand there was a lot uh, that, that centralized around this idea of justice. Now, for those of you that grew up in the early uh, 60s, you, you probably know, leading up to the 60s, uh, the gay culture really did, it was largely underground at the time, okay? In fact, I think it's 49 of, of the states in, in the United States had it illegal to actually practice. Even if it was consensual, you would be found legal. You could spend time in jail if you were found to be practicing uh, any kind of consensual, non-consensual gay practices. This all changed in June 28th, 1969 at a place called Stonewall Inn. It was a fire that fueled the first wave of the gay pride movement found in Greenwich Village. Anyone ever heard of this or been there? Yes, uh, it was a huge movement. Uh, there was a large congregation at the Stonewall Inn that was a, where the gay community predominantly found a haven. It was mafia owned, so they were extorted. There was lots of stuff going on. Um, but over time, uh, during one day, June 28th, 1969, the police raided it uh, for many different reasons. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And the gay uh, community that, that was there revolted. Uh, there was a riot that ensued. And that is what most people agree kind of launched the gay pride movement. S- David Carter, uh, he wrote a book called Stonewall. It's a fascinating book. Uh, and in an interview, he, he was actually there. He was a part of it. He uh, laid out a three-part plan after the riot uh, of how they were going to move forward. Instead of being this underground movement, they needed more exposures, kind of the sentiment. And he laid out a three-part plan that they were all kind of moving forward with. One was to remove hem- homosexuality as a disorder from the APA, the American uh, Psychological Association, saying that uh, you know, a gay, a lesbian was not a mental illness because it was defined as a mental illness up until then. The second part was to have legislative approach This was about striking down laws that would limit them and establishing protection for those that did uh, practice. And the third aim I thought was kind of interesting was to take aim at the church. The idea here was to remove homosexuality as a sin. In Carter's own words, he said, the third one was recognizably the hardest. Well, this began to stir and this led to many things. Uh, One of the things called the Gay Liberation Front, which was uh, an organization and an activist group that led for um, ideas of liberation and, and for rights, for recognition. And all of this began to grow more and more uh, as the movement began to grow, but it was more flamboyant. It was more uh, kind of loud and proud. It wasn't as organized as it was today. And then the 80s happened. And if you lived in those times, you remember the AIDS epidemic. And the AIDS uh, epidemic changed everything. Uh, instead of activating, instead of moving forward, for the most part, it became tending to the wounded, to the ones that they may be loved. Um, it predominantly affected uh, homosexual gay men more than women. 
Uh, and they're spent a good decade of putting resources that would go to activism towards science and the advent of, of um, medicines that would help into treating and walking through uh, many of their wounded in that sense. But all that changed in the 90s. February of 1988, a war conference of 175 leading gay activists convened New York, if I remember right, to establish a nationwide media campaign. They wanted to shift the narrative um, because it just wasn't working and, and uh, everyone, even uh, for a long time, if you remember in the 80s, AIDS was kind of associated with homosexual practice. Uh, and we know that's it's a much broader now and, and there's more, but, but you understand there was, the narrative was kind of laid out and they wanted to change that. And so the very next year, 1998, Marshall Kirk, a Harvard grad and a marketing specialist, and Hunter Madsen, a Harvard uh, professor, wrote uh, a manifesto, if you will. It's a book called After the Ball. Now, I'm just curious, has anyone read this book, After the Ball? See, that's what I thought. Probably because you can't even find a used copy on Amazon for $250. (laughs) It is hard to find, um, but I had it. It's an interesting book. Um, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen lay out their plan on how to move forward to change the narrative of the growing community of gay and lesbians. And they laid out a three-part strategy uh, that they would say through marketing would change the culture. And I just wanna show this to you. And once again, hear my heart in here. I'm not trying to be biased with this in any way. I'm just trying to give you some historical framework to, to show you where we're, how we got where we're at today. The first part was to desensitize, to just kind of make people numb to the issue and the issue of homosexuality. The second part was to jam. Jam any kind of preconceived ideas you had, maybe religious or not. Uh, and then thirdly was to convert. Under desensitize, this is taken from the book After the Ball. This is uh, from Madsen and Kirk. They write this. At least on the outset, we see desensitization and nothing more. You can forget about trying right up front to persuade folks that homosexuality is a good thing. But if you can get them to think that it's just another thing, meriting no more than a shrug of the shoulders, then your battle for legal and social rights, or justice, I would say, is virtually won. We can extract the following principle for our campaign, to desensitize straights to gays and gayness, inundate them with a continuous flood of gay-related advertising presented in the least offensive fashion possible. If straights can't shut off the shower, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. The third part was jam. And uh, again, taking from after the ball, in any campaign, To win over the public, gays must be portrayed as victims in need of protection so that straights will be inclined by reflex to adopt the role of protector. First, the public should be persuaded that gays are victims of circumstance, that that they no more chose their sexual orientation than they did, say, their height, skin, color, talents, or limitations. We argue that for all practical purposes, gays should be considered to have been born gay. Even though sexual orientation for most humans seems to be the product of complex interaction between innate predispositions and environmental factors during childhood and early adolescence. To suggest in public that homosexuality might be chosen is to open the can of worms labeled moral choice and sin and give the religious intransigence a stick to beat us with. And thirdly, in their plan to convert, I'm just taking an excerpt from here. Uh, we mean conversion of the American, average American's emotions, minds, and will through a planned psychological attack in the form of propaganda, propaganda fed to the nation via the media. First, you get your foot in the door by being as similar as possible. Then, and only then, when your one little difference is finally accepted, can you start dragging in your other peculiarities one by one. You hammer in the wedge narrow end first, And as the saying goes, allow the camel's nose beneath your tent and the whole body will follow soon. So you kind of see, this is, you know, it's not hard to kind of see, you know, some of this, the strategy. It's a a fascinating book if you're ever interested to see how things kind of, how you can almost reverse engineer to where we got today from the progressive and, and justice side. Now on the other side, you have the historical, right? And, and this is predominantly, uh, if you're heavy on this side, it, it follows morality, right? 
And this is about heavy morals. This is about, you know, we're a, we're a nation founded on godly principles and, and the scripture. Uh, and you saw this movement because, listen, you may say, well, you know, I'm not in a war. Well, guess what? You are. Uh, whether you like it or not, you're part of it. And, and it's a cultural war that's happening. And in a war, you have both sides firing. And on this side, you can see the justice rally cry. And on this side, you can see the cry for morality and for good morals. You, you see this clearly. And as, as the progressive side was becoming louder and, and, and bigger, the moral side began to grow. You had the formation of the group, uh, the moral majority. How many remember the moral majority growing up? Yeah. Uh, this was a growing Christian fundamentalist counter. Uh, they did this by making substantial push. You saw this uh, in the courts through for prayer and, and Bibles being permitted in school. Um, uh, there was a lots of opposition, obviously, to abortion rights, uh, to the ERA, Equal Rights Association, uh, opposition to gay rights. You can see how this was clashing and coming together. Leading the charge for the morality uh, and was the moral majority leader, Jerry Falwell. How many of you remember Jerry Falwell? Here's a couple quotes uh, from Jerry Falwell that I thought was interesting. AIDS is not just God's punishment for homosexuals. It's God's punishment for the society that tolerates homosexuals. The idea that religion and politics don't mix was invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own country. Someone must not be afraid to say moral perversion is wrong, and if you do not act now, homosexuals will own America. If you and I don't speak up now, this homosexual steamroller will literally crush all decent men, women, and children that get in the way, and our nation will pay a terrible price. Tinky Winky is gay. <laughs> Tinky Winky is gay. I don't know. And then this, uh, if you're not a born-again Christian, you're a failure as a human being. This led to movements that you might have known, legislation called DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, which was a, a, a a movement to recognize in the courts that marriage is made between a man and a woman. I do want to say that this is interesting. If you remember that, it was signed by President Bill Clinton. The Defense of Marriage Act was signed by Bill Clinton. I just, well, that's interesting. <laughs> all of this leads to a culture war that we've all found ourselves in. When I was pastoring a church in downtown, I had a gay non-practicing Christian who approached me after coming for several weeks and just said, Jake, I love the teaching. I love the scriptures. I, I love all of this, but I'm just tired. And I need a place where I can just be accepted. And both sides of this, no matter where you sit on this, whether it's all the way over here, all the way over here, or maybe somewhere in the middle, you feel and recognize the tension of this. Right. And so I think it's important that we understand that what I want to talk about tonight is this. I think God gives us an alternative way an invitation to something else for all of us. And to do that, we've got to dig into the scriptures. You see, it's important that we understand so many of us perceive the scriptures as law, as this archaic kind of, you know, strict rules to follow. It is not that. If you're a Christ follower, this is life-giving. This is something, listen, when, when the fall happened, everything as it was, was broken. And we've seen the spiral of that in ourselves and in society. And when God gave us the scriptures, it was an instruction book to say, here's the alternative way to live. And even if you don't understand it, even if it doesn't make sense, I want you to trust it because I'm the creator and I have the better perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. My kids, when they were young, they, they used to say, you would pull up to McDonald's and be like, can I have a Happy Meal? I'll never ask for anything else in my life. <laughs> never. I'm like, and you as a parent, you're like, yeah, right. Right, because you have a different perspective. You understand, you have a, you have a higher sense uh, of living than they do. And when we put our trust in the scripture, it's life, man. 
It's an invitation for something alternative. It's not a drag. It's a way to live the way it was designed to. Now, as I said, you might think there's a lot of scriptures that reference homosexuality, and there's actually only six that are in the whole Bible. And tonight, we're going to cover five of those. I'm not going to cover the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, scriptures because I just don't find it relevant. On both sides, you'll kind of see that um, it's just non-relevant to the issue of homosexuality. How many, how many of you know that the scriptures actually reference, reference Sodom and Gomorrah's, the punishment that happened to them wasn't homosexuality, like a lot of us kind of know, is actually, in the scriptures tell us, this pride or inhospitality in a sense, uh, sick in the hospitality. Um, but that's what the scriptures tell us. And so I just think it's irrelevant to, to the scriptures that are used. These five that we're going to go over um, on the progressive side have been called the clobber scriptures because we've used and utilized them as a church to batter and to hurt, and a lot of pain has happened in using these wrongly. And so I think it's important for us to dig into them and understand, because listen to me, church, listen. Um, This issue of homosexuality in the gay community, there's no argument about what the Bible says. There's a lot of speculation and argument about what the Bible means in these scriptures. Okay, and that's important for us as Christ followers to fully understand this too. Because if this doesn't touch you, this topic in some way, get ready because it will. And so it's important for us to be good stewards of this, to be good students as the Bereans were uh, in the New Testament. So um, let's just dive in. Um, One of the things I just got to say in context that uh, you, when you, if you dig into a lot of books, and I'm going to give you a list of resources uh, at the end of this if you want to do your own uh, in-depth study, but uh, there's a lot of um, talk, especially on, on both sides of this, about the Greco-Roman culture and what sexuality was like when Christ and Paul uh, walked the earth um, because there were a lot of crazy things. Let me just tell you, if you, do, if you want an interesting study, and I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it because it is crazy, um, you think our culture is saturated with sexuality and some of the perverse things, whatever you, you want to call it. In the Greek and Roman era, there were a lot of, lot of crazy things. And so a lot of the things that, that the progressive side may argue comes from a lot of that culture. Um, and, and you just got to understand it's a very different than what we kind of know. Okay, uh, For instance, pederasty or uh, men having sex with boys uh, specifically teenage boys, 13 to 17, 18 years old, was very common in the Greco-Roman culture. Uh, many of those men, and it was predominantly men, uh, were even married. This was just a cultural kind of, it just happened. And, and you can understand, you can see how the church in Rome and Corinth were such a stark difference uh, and a light in a dark world because it was so counter to what the scriptures um, or the 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 church was living at the time. So, all right, so let's dive in. Genesis chapter two, verses 18 through 25. Um, The rest of the scriptures that I'm going to give you from here are literal Greek word for word translations. And and I I did that to just kind of help us fully understand this. Um, So it's going to kind of sound clunky when I read it to you. Uh, That's because it is a literal word for word translation. It's not thought for thought, which most of our translations are kind of. And it doesn't mean those are false in any way. It just helps you get a better perspective uh, of what the actual uh, Greek and Hebrew was saying. So uh, verse 18, chapter 2. At the beginning of it, it's important that we go to the beginning because we got to understand the intention of this. What, what, What is marriage? Uh, how did you define that? Where did you learn that definition and, and, and your framework for it? Uh, Genesis chapter two, uh, there's a lot in here. So let's unpack it. Verse 18, Yahweh God said, it's not good for the human being to be on his own. I'll make him a helper, what? Suitable, Suitable for him. Verse 19, Yahweh God shaped from the ground every creature of the wild and every bird in the heavens and brought them to the human being to see what he'd call it. Whatever the human being called a living being, that became its name. The human being gave names to all the animals, to the birds in the heavens, and to all the creatures of the wild. But for a human being, he didn't find a helper, what? Suitable Suitable for him. So Yahweh God made a coma fall on the human being, so he slept, took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. 
Yahweh God built the rib that he had taken from the human being into a woman and brought her to the human being. The human being said, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, or the Hebrew literal word is isha, uh, because from a man, ish is, is man, which is kind of interesting. Uh, isha comes from ish. Uh, this one was taking, verse 24. That's why a man abandons his father and his mother and what? Attaches himself to his woman and they become one flesh. We've heard this. The two of them were naked and the man and his woman, but they felt no shame. Now, at first glance at this, you might say, okay, the man and the woman became one flesh. That answers it right there. Okay, that's very clear. The plumbing works, <laughs> right? Like that should solve the debate right there. Not so, not so fast. Um, the term one flesh, the, the phrase Adam says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It can mean sexual union, but it doesn't necessarily wholly mean that. It more is making reference to the leaving of one family, a severing, and a beginning in a new family. And you can see this uh, phrase is used, um, one flesh, uh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Uh, Jacob uses it when he's uh, approaching his family member Laban. He says, this is bone of my bone, this is flesh of my flesh. Uh, no, uh, Naomi and Ruth, uh, there's, a, there's the same Hebrew word that's used for becoming one flesh. Doesn't mean they slept with each other, okay? It means there was a cleaving, right? There was a leaving, a severing of one family, and it's a beginning of another family. Now, it can mean sexual union, so it's not limited, but it leaves it very vague, right? So what else does Genesis have for us that would kind of unpack? Well, the progressive view that seems to make the most sense to me. And I'm gonna, listen, there's a thousand kind of different things. If you read all these books, I'm gonna give you kind of both sides and, and what they say and where I think kind of the scripture kind of really is saying. The progressive view that seems the most, that to make the most sense is that what Adam needed was a suitable helper. This word suitable becomes very important because their argument the progressive side says that the helper, as you know, Adam, you know, God created animals, right? And, and it says that Adam said, this isn't the helper. This isn't a suitable helper to me, right? So there was a need for a companion, for a suitable helper. And after creating animals, he's, the, he said, this isn't, there's just, it's not right. It's not a suitable helper to me. There needs to be something more. And their argument on the progressive side is that it wasn't, it wasn't an animal, but it was a human, okay? And that what uh, Adam needed for, as a suitable helper was just uh, Eve's humanness, not her femaleness. Does that make sense? So you can see why even this word suitable helper becomes really important in this discussion. So the Hebrew word for suitable is konegdo. Everyone say konegdo. Well done, you're Hebrew scholars now. <laughs> What's interesting about the word konegdo is this is the only time it's used in the Hebrew Bible, um, which makes it that much more important. Now, what also makes this word kind of interesting is it's a compound word. Okay, so it's two words brought together, like, like the word understand, right? You under and stand, two words brought together have a meaning. So K, uh, if you were to pull apart this word, uh, means as or like, and neged means opposite, uh, against, or in front of. So together, uh, this means something like as opposite him or like against him. You with me so far? Yeah. Now here's, here's when you look at that word then, you can clearly see that it wasn't just her humanness that made a suitable helper, but it was her unique feminism. It was the female part of this that brought, listen, if, if it was just her humanness that was needed, then, then you can argue, yeah, it could be a man or a man and a woman with a woman, but if that were the case, then the Hebrew word, they could have just used the, the first part of that compound word, the K, which is as is. 
but he doesn't, the scriptures don't use that. They, they describe it as more like against him or as opposite him. Now, next week, we're gonna talk about gender identity and we're gonna open that whole can of worms. Yeah, get ready. <laughs> We're going, to go, we're going to go into this a little bit more, this part, because it's important to this. But you've got to understand here what the scriptures are really saying is that this is more of the opposites are needed. Okay, There's something uniquely different that Adam didn't have as a male that Eve had in her femaleness in the opposite of it that made this important, that made her a suitable helper. Are you with me? All right, now this is important because this is the design. This is kind of at the beginning. This is an intention. Uh, let's skip to the next Old Testament verses. Leviticus 18, uh, verses 22, and Leviticus 20, verses 13. Um, the word Leviticus, uh, the Hebrew word is vayikra. Everyone say vayikra. vayikra. It means he called, all right? This is the, the follow-up into Moses' narrative, and it's the actual call. If you read Leviticus, I know all of you are like, I love Leviticus, <laughs> I just, I can't wait to go, st you know, half the time you read through Leviticus, you're like, oh Lord, please just give me some strength, Holy Spirit, right? Uh, but if you read Leviticus, it's about holiness. 87 times that word holy is talked about. Holy is about being separated then. We talk, the scriptures, it's an alternative life, right? This is, this is what God is saying. I'm holy, be holy like me. And then he gives these verses, Leviticus 18, 22 says, you will not sleep with a male as one sleeps with a woman. It's an offensive act. Leviticus 20, 13, someone who sleeps with a male as one sleeps with a woman, the two of them have performed an offensive act. They are absolutely to be put to death. Their shed blood is against them. Now, the progressive view that seems the, the, to make the most sense to me in this argument says this, that, that this is Old Testament and we live in the New Testament, yeah. right? And their, our, their argument goes something like this. Well, there's a Leviticus verse that says you shall not eat shrimp, right? Or you shouldn't get tattoos or cut the sides of your head, you know? Or are you gonna make those you know, something we have to live by? No, we live under the new covenant, under Jesus's uh, sanctification or propitiation uh, for our sins. That's, that's kind of that side. Uh, John Shore, uh, a progressive uh, gay um, Christian, says this, in practice, Christians do not follow uh, the dictates of the Old Testament. If they did, polygamy would be illegal, would be legal, and forbidden would be things like tattoos, wearing mixed fabrics, eating pork, and seeding lawns with a variety of grasses. And the Christian day of worship would be Saturday, not Sunday, to which everyone here said, Amen! <laughs> now, additionally, uh, progressives will uh, argue that this is prohibiting not uh, consensual uh, sex between uh, a male and male or same sex, but exploitive sex. Uh, types like rape, temple prostitution, or a man forcing himself on a boy, which I got to tell you, church, this did happen. And it was very frequent. There is some legit legitimacy to this. The other side to this is um, if you're looking at the scriptures on the historical side, um, if it is uh, exploitive, if it's about rape uh, and, and a man forcing himself on a boy, it's usually a power um, dynamic that's happening. It's a um, dominant and a submissive. Does that make sense? Or the receiver. And that's the argument is this has happened quite often in, in culture as, you know, temple prostitution, all types of this throughout history. If that were what the writers of Leviticus were saying, then they wouldn't have included um, that, um, hold on here. Well, they wouldn't have, and I'll just, yeah. They wouldn't have said um, that they are absolutely to be put to death. They or their shed blood is against them. 
the, the scriptures use these words as they're mutual. If it was a dominant, if it was a, a man and, and you know, forcing himself on a boy in that sense, then it, there wouldn't be a shared punishment with that because one would be forced. It wouldn't be, there wasn't participation. And so Leviticus is very clear. This is a shared thing because it was a shared punishment at the time. Does that make sense? So then the other question to ask is, are these commands relevant for today? That's a great question. Okay, and let's just be clear. The Old and the New Testament are not separated, okay? There is no, and, and even the phrases, I hate Old Testament and New Testament because it gives us the sense that it's old, it's irrelevant, it's not needed. And that is a lie, church, okay? The Old Testament is necessary. Jesus himself said that I didn't come to abolish the Torah, the scriptures, the Old Testament, if you will. I came to fulfill it. He's not throwing it out. The Old Testament is just as important as the New Testament. You with me? So remember, Leviticus is about holiness. It's about being made holy, being made right. And to understand Leviticus, you gotta understand there's three types of instructions here, okay? One, there's the ceremonial, the, civil, the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law, okay? And we can get caught in the weeds on this, but let me just kind of explain that the ceremonial was how we um, made sacrifices, how we made ourselves right to get holy, okay? Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. There is no need to animal sacrifice. There is no need for, for the blood of animals to cover our sins because Jesus' blood did that. It was the sacrifice. So the moral sin is, is not relevant. Sorry, the ceremonial sin is not relevant and not necessarily needed today because Jesus fulfilled that. The civil uh, this was how you ran your group, how you ran the country does not apply to us because we don't live in a theocracy, okay? We live in a democracy and those we can define in that. Um, a lot of that though was, um, you know, well, the last part is the moral and this still does apply to us, all right? This also included things that didn't necessarily make sense but were meant for the Israelites to do to be set apart, Okay, they didn't wear mixed clothes, right? They didn't cut the sides of their heads. All of this was as to be different than the cultures around them. And God was asking them to obey this, okay? But at the very core of it too, you have a lot of moral issues that me and you would not argue. Here's a list of some of those commands that are covered in Leviticus as it pertains to the moral law. You have incest, adultery, child sacrifice, bestiality, theft, taking the Lord's name in vain. You see this whole list of stuff. And if you were to say, this is Old Testament and not necessary, we don't have to follow this, then we have to, fo then we have to throw all this others out too. Adultery, bestiality, child sacrifice. The truth is, is the moral law is still applicable. Are you with me? This is important that we understand this, okay? Because these verses in Leviticus we'll come back to in this next part. Now, you may be saying, Leviticus only mentions men. <laughs> You're correct, okay? And that leads us into the New Testament in the book of Romans now. Romans chapter one, verses 24 through 27 says this as it pertains to homosexuality. Therefore, God gave them over in their desires of their hearts to uncleanness, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Some exchanged God's truth with a falsehood and they reverenced and venerated creation or lifted them up instead of the creator who was blessed to the era. So all my Swifty fans said, yay, amen. Because this is true, God gave them over to dishonoring, what is that word? Passions. For their females exchanged natural relations for the against naturals. Once again, this is the literal translation. And likewise, also the males releasing natural relations with females burned in their appetites for one another, males with males, affecting the shameful and receiving among themselves the penalty that was necessary for the deception. All right, first, you might say that word in your translation at the beginning, the uncleanness to dishonor their bodies among themselves, your translation might say sexual immorality, okay? And you might point to the scripture and say, well, this is very clear then. It's not so clear, okay? Because the Greek word that's used here is a very general phrase. 
Think of it as like the junk drawer that Paul used to kind of cover all sexual related issues and sins. It includes rape, sex outside of marriage, adultery, and other sins, both gay and straight. You with me? So we can't really say that that's applicable. It doesn't really tell us much. The progressive view that seems to make the most sense to me is that this is not about committed, monogamous, same-sex relationships, but heterosexual excess, passion, and lust. He talks about idol worship in here and a lot of exchanging, right? They're saying this is, this is someone who, who is so hungry after watching pornography that they have to take it to the next level. Does that make sense? Most gay believers will tell you, this doesn't describe me. This isn't my experience with same-sex relationships. And I can understand this. this. This can make sense. At the same time, what is Paul really talking about here? Okay, is this about, because at the core of this, is this about motive or is this about the actual practice of a person, because if it's motives and you say, well, it's just someone just in full rage of lust that is acting in excessive, they're, they're abusing uh, boys, they're, they're being the dominant one, right? And taking that to someone that's more submissive to that. Or is it actually the practice that Paul is talking about here? The historical view says this, no, it's not about practice, it, or about motive, it is about the actual practice of it. And to understand that, you gotta understand where this all started in the book of Genesis. Now, I know you're going, Genesis again, this is why it's important you go back. The rabbis used to have a practice, they called it the law first. So everyone say law first. Law first, law first um, really accentuated the importance for the Old Testament because when you would write something, if you were to read the Bible in 90 days straight, Okay, you would start to notice from the bird's eye view, hey, that's the same kind of phrase that was found in Isaiah, Ezekiel, in Genesis, and uh, even Leviticus. And they do that on purpose. There's a reason for that. We call it the law of first. You can make a statement in the New Testament that has as much weight and power as it does. When you understand what it ties to in the original, it has that much more weight and explanation. Does that make sense? So why is this important? Because I believe this is what Paul is doing. If you read Romans one through three, <clears throat> Paul begins to use words like creator and creation. And you see this even in the verses that we read. They, they worship the creator uh, or the created, not the creator. And all through Romans one through three, you see him seven times use Greek words that were found in the Greek translation of Genesis. Now, why is Paul doing this? For a reason. He's trying to point back to something. When he's talking about against nature, what nature is he talking about? Orientation? No, he's talking about something I think much deeper, all the way back to the nature in Genesis. You tracking with me? All right, so this is not a power dynamic. I think we can rule that out uh, because in the scriptures it says both are burning for each other, not just one. If it was a passive and it was more of a dominant ex, you know, kind of uh, sex that he's talking about, then he would have not said that they shared passion. This is also the first reference that we have where Paul is addressing females, lesbians, in this conversation of it. And he, he echoes it back all the way to Genesis, all right? Um, it, it's just evident, I think, when you read this and, and go back and forth, that this is what Paul is referring to, is the natural way, the complementarity of a man and a woman as Genesis defined it in the beginning. That's what makes it unnatural, when a man is with a man and a woman with a woman. Does that make sense? I think that's what Paul is really trying to say. 
uh, a gay progressive theologian, uh, Louis Compton, Crompton said this in, his, in one of his books. Even he agrees with this. According to the progressive interpretation, Paul's words are not directed at bona fide homosexuals in committed relationships, but such a reading, however well-intentioned, seems strained and unhistorical. Nowhere does Paul or any other Jewish writer of this period imply the least acceptance of same-sex relations under any circumstance. The idea that homosexuals might be redeemed by mutual devotion would have been wholly foreign to Paul or any Jew or early Christian. Lastly, I want to remind you of this before we move on to our last set of scriptures, is that Romans 1 through 3 lists a host of, of different sins, not just this. Um, Adultery, drunkenness, we read some of them. Church, for us to weaponize some of these verses is irresponsible because as Roman says it, we're all up a creek and we all need Jesus. And as I've heard it said, the best description is we're all beggars who found bread showing other beggars where bread is. And just because you got bread first and found it first doesn't mean that you get to gloat and hold it over someone else. Does that make sense? We have to be very careful and wise in this. All right, lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, and 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. I'm gonna read 1 Timothy, but I'm not gonna reference it because they're both dealing with the same thing here. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the wrongdoers won't inherit God's empire? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral ones, nor demon worship, nor adulterers, nor males being penetrated by males, nor males penetrating males, nor thieves, nor the ones wanting more and more, not boozers, not snubbers, not the rapacious, will inherit God's empire. Some of you were these sorts. We read this verse at the beginning, but you were washed, but you were made devoted, but you were righted in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christos, and in our God's spirit. 1 Timothy 1.8 says, we know that the code, the law, the Old Testament is beautiful if someone uses it in a covenant code manner. Knowing this, that the code isn't laid down for the righteous ones, but for the non-code and disordered people, but for the impious and the sinful ones, for the unsaintly and profane, for the father and mother killers, for men murderers, or sexually immoral. And then once again, this phrase, for males penetrating males, for men snatchers or kidnappers, for falsifiers, for false oath takers, if any other person opposes, uh, uh, any other person opposes healthy teachings consistent with the gospel of the splendor, blessed God with which I have been trusted. Now, there is a lot happening in, this, uh, in these verses, but mainly with two Greek words specifically. And I don't have the time to go into all the context, okay? But uh, there is a lot of context here, or little context, and a ton of interpretations. Just let me show you. The words that we're talking about, uh, the one Greek word is malakoi. Everyone say malakoi. And arsenikoitai. Everyone say arsenikoitai. Well done. These are the two words that we're referencing here. And you can see just from this graph alone on the left there is all the different translations that we use today. Maybe you could see the one you use. And you can see in the first Corinthians, uh, the Malakoi and Arsenikoitai and Arsenikoitai and the Timothy, all the different words and the translations that you can see. You can see how differing this is, right? I mean, at one point, practicing homosexuals. Homosexuals, is there a difference? Those practicing sodomites, men who have sex with men, effeminate, homosexuals. You can read it and you go, how in the world do we have all these different translations, right? Um, the translation I gave you, or the literal is, is the closest to it, um, but if, if you're wondering, the NIV probably has the best translation for this because it's not an orientation, it's the act of, all right? Now, progressives argue this when it comes to this. It seems to make the most sense to me, um, that we don't know the language and we can't be sure about the specifics here. Men having sex with men, but it seems vague, Right? Also, this is believed once again to be talking about call boys or prostitution, not committed, consensual, same-sex relationships. And honestly, once again, giving you context, this, was, this happened. 
There was a lot of this um, sick kind of immoral sexuality that was going on. But I don't think that this is what Paul is talking about in this. And so it depends on, you know, the scriptures that we're looking at. So malakoi, the f- that first word there, it means this. Translates to soft or delicate. Now, Paul never uses this word anywhere else. Usually when you're translating words, you want to go and say, where else does the writer use this in the book that he's writing? If you can't find that, then you go, well, where else is it used in the New Testament or Old Testament? If you can't find that, where is it used, say, in the whole, whole of Scripture? We don't have this. Malachi is kind of a unique word, and it just translates as in uh, soft or delicate. Um, so, I mean, do, is Paul just saying, I don't, don't wear soft sweaters? <laughs> You know, like, what's he really getting at here? Um, I don't think he's saying that because the issue and the topic that he's talking about is more serious, right? Uh, So I don't think he's talking about like a fabric or or not. We probably think that the word soft that he's using is, it means effeminate in the Roman use, okay? And uh, that's a man who's trying to be a woman. This, This is very common, um, but the real question is, is, does this mean sexually too? And that depends on this next word. And this is the one that we're going to kind of wrap up on, arsenikoitai. Now, arsenikoitai is interesting. It's a compound word. Once again, it's two words put together. The word uh, arsen, uh, meaning man, and koitai, meaning bed. So if you translate this together, it could translate betters of men in, in a sexual connotation. Now, what part of what makes this so confusing and so highly debated is that this is a made up word. It's not used in, you can scout, I mean, historians, theologians have scoured. There's no such word as ar- arsenikoitai. Uh, Paul just made it up. Now, seriously, and now we find a couple references in later kind of Jewish history, but we think that they're actually referencing Paul's use of word arsenikoitai here. So what is Paul doing? And what is, why is this important? You can see how all of this hinges on this one word and why it's so important. All right, when it comes to translating words, it's helpful to see the same word um, if it's used in the Greek text. So here's what I think is happening. And this is my best guess, is that Paul is taking two words found from the book of Leviticus, chapter 18 and verses 20, and inventing a phrase that he's using for the first time. Let me show you this picture here. Here's what the relevant text looks like in the Septuagint, okay? This is the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis that, that we know of, all right? Um, you will not, so Leviticus 18 and then Leviticus 20, you can see, see there. Meta arsenos, right? Koiten, you see those two words there? And then in Leviticus 20, hasokamathi, meta arsenos, koiten, gyanikos, right? You can see, like, I'm, that's why I'm showing you this. You can see from the second text in particular how Paul's use of arsenikoitai is almost certainly taken from the book of Leviticus. He's taking the two words and phrases that are found in Leviticus. Why? Because that's the holiness code. And what does Leviticus reference? Reference is pointing to Genesis, And I just don't think this is accident. I just don't think that you can argue, you know, anything else, but that Paul was very clearly making references to Leviticus unnatural uh, relations as it was prescribed in Genesis. So, you know, and and think about this. How many of you are Shakespeare fans, right? A couple. (laughs) Shakespeare was littered with scripture references, right? It's all kinds of Bible references. It it wouldn't be a surprise to a trained rabbi in the era of Jesus to reference like the old rabbinic code in Genesis and Leviticus. He was doing just as any other writer would have done in referencing that and tying it together. All right, so about this time, you might be asking, as we're turning into a full-on university lecture here. (laughs) You might be asking, well, what about? (laughs) 
Ugh, I understand. Like I said, this is very nuanced. And I want to kind of wrap things up uh, really quickly by answering some of these questions in a rapid one-minute answer. After the service, I'm going to make myself available in the front to, for any kind of discussion or dialogue you want to have or more questions as best as I can answer it. So uh, first question, are people born gay? Yes, maybe. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, the APA, the American Psychological Association, defines it, this issue and says this. There is no conscientious consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factors or factors. Many think that nature and nurture both play complex roles. Most people experience little or no sense of choice about their sexual orientation. I think that this is right. I think that there is a complex mixture of nature versus um, nurture. nurture that are going on there. At the same time, when you read stories and you talk to people who have grown up feeling and understanding that this, they, there is no choice in this, that they were born this way, I can sympathize with that. I can understand that. I, there, there are many stories I've read about that I go, I don't see how, I don't know how this works, God. It doesn't make sense to me. But I think it is possible that someone could be born gay. I think it's okay. To, and here's, here's the meat of it. Really, when you ask it, what does it matter? Yeah. Okay? Because in the end, I think the scriptures are being very clear that to be a practicing, whether you were born it or not, to practice it, is against the nature. It's against God's law with it. You know? So, you know, you know some people say, and even on our teaching team, we've gone back and forth on this, right? You know, so you can say some people have born with more of a, a you know, a propensity to, to drink more than others for other addictions. Could that be part of it? I, I don't know. Like I said, I think it is a complex mixture of some of this. And I think the best approach is we have to be loving and graceful in this. Good, what does Jesus say about this? Oh, whew. Jesus doesn't address this topic specifically, but he does talk about divorce. And I don't want to take it out of context because he's talking about in divorce. But when he talks about divorce, he references Genesis. He references the creation. He references the intention. And I think that can give us a clue into this, just like Paul referencing it. I think if you were to take these verses that we looked at and, and to take them individually, yeah, you could probably find some discrepancies with it over that individual ones. But when you see this collectively built over the scriptures, I think it becomes very, very clear on this. Can people change their orientation? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, probably not. Uh, I know this, that no one should force someone to change. There's been a lot of toxic, harmful, I would even argue maybe illegal practices to change someone's. It's been very harmful. But here's the other part is I know people and, and Christians who have said, I've been completely delivered from any kind of attraction to the same sex that I had, right. and God's given me that. I do think that's possible. But there are also people who say, I have prayed for this, I have ached for this, and God has not answered my prayer for this. And they're called to live a celibate life. And that is hard, and that's hard to understand. And I don't know the nuances of that, but in our practice, in our uh, involvement, I think we have to be graceful and loving once again. Can someone attend Jubilee and be welcome if they disagree? Absolutely. Amen. I hope this place can be an open place for you to come and attend. I hope you can sit and feel love. I hope you can sit and not be clobbered left and right. I hope you can feel this is a place that you can find community. 
I will say that we do have to do a better job about including and creating space for, you know, those that are practicing singleness. You know, I think it's a shame that, you know, it's easier for someone to find a companion with a swipe of an app than they can in a church. And I think we need to do better with that. At the same time, I recognize the church can't be everything to all people. You know, and, and I hope we can create a space that you feel comfortable to talk, to be loved, to attend, to worship God, even if we disagree in this. And lastly, Jake, you're biased. <laughs> You've got an agenda, right? I, I, listen, I, it's not lost on me. Like, I'm a heterosexual male, married, and four kids. <laughs> you know, that's not lost on me. I, I want to give you uh, at the resource center at the info center out there, a list of books um, that might intrigue you a little bit. I want to just show you them real quick. This first one, this is both sides that I want to show you here. And I think if you read these, if you go, like, I want to dive into this, this is what is going to happen to you, okay? I promise you. You're going to go, oh, I didn't know that. And then you're going to go, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't see that. And, oh, that's interesting. I, huh. And then I think over time, you're going to start to see the, the dust kind of settle and, and things will become quite clear as you do. Does that make sense? So this first one, this is a progressive uh, author, Matthew Vines. It's a very popular book, God and the Gay Christian. If you want to read about that side of it and the progressive side of it, this is a great book. I find the theology pretty weak in it, um, but it's worth a read. Uh, if you read that one, I'd read this next one side by side, People to be Loved by Preston Sprinkle. Uh, the theology is solid in this, and the tone I really love uh, in this book. Um, last, our next... Um, uh, Kevin DeYoung's What Does the Bible Really Teach About Homosexuality? Uh, this book is mercifully, mercifully small. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and it, but it is so potent. Uh, the academics in it and the theology is so good. If you're looking just for, hey, a quick read on it, and the tone can be a bit harsh on it, uh, but, but overall the theology is very, very good. You might read that next to this book, Colby Martin's on Clobber, Rethinking Our Misuse of the Bible on Homosexuality. This will argue for the theology uh, of the progressive side. And uh, like the other one, I felt like uh, the, the theology on this was just a bit watered down. Uh, but take a read for yourself. Be a Berean and study. Next book, uh, Torn. This is um, a, a book told from the perspective of one that struggled through this on the progressive side, who's landed there. Next. This is uh, Washed and Waiting by Wesley Hill. Phenomenal book of someone that's walked through this. It's a personal account of someone who is uh, gay, uh, but non-practicing. And it is, um, I'll tell you, a lot of these books like this are going to just rip at your heart, man. They will just rip at your heart, but they're very, very good to read and get the next perspective. Go ahead, next one. Uh, this one, Love of Wars, same one. If you were to read any book, I'd recommend this one. This is a story of this guy who's non-practicing but is learning to live as a celibate uh, gay. Next book, um, Homosexual in the Bible. Maybe you say, Jake, all right, I'm not going to read all these books. Is there one book that gives both sides of it that I can just read? It's simple. This is your book, okay? It has wonderful uh, commentary in it, very... Um, uh, academic uh, in its content, but put in a, in a good way. And it's not crazy long. Uh, if you're looking for something like that, I would recommend that as well. Lastly, as I close, you all with me so far? Okay, we're going to wrap it up right here. How do we engage with this? How do we engage with this? What is the invitation that, I, that, that God offers us? Instead of leaning next, necessarily one or this way, what is the invitation? Man, it's so simple, guys. It can sound stupid. It is Jesus, man. It's Jesus. And if we're wondering, how do I live in this culture? How you live the alternative way that Jesus showed us. Do you know that the first church, they weren't called Christians. They were called followers of the, the way. It was the way. And this is an invitation not to lay down and die. This is an invitation to live. You saw those that got baptized today. Man, they weren't bummed. Were they? Like I was in tears almost just seeing. This is the alternative life that Jesus offers. It's the way. 
And here's the deal is when we alter, we've all got to love something, right? Love is going somewhere, it's directed somewhere. And when it's not directed towards God and following in the way of Jesus, then it turns in on ourselves. C.S. Lewis says that when we do this, it's like a black hole in our soul and it collapses on itself. When left just to ourselves, we'll, we'll, everything gets collapsed in that. Jesus, listen to this church, Jesus taught the highest ethics I mean, at one point he's saying, if your eye causes you to sin, to lust, take out your eye, right? But at the same time, prostitutes, sinners wanted to be around him. There was no compromise in that, but the love was always there. Think about it this way, and I'll close with this thought. Uh, We read the story of the tax collector, right? Zacchaeus. And we often forget about the context of what a tax collector was. Tax collector was rotten. I mean, just to put you in context, it would be like a drug dealer, okay? Or a, let's say a pimp selling drugs for his pornographic video company to funnel money to a terrorist organization. <laughs> okay? Hated. I mean, despised among all groups. And Jesus tells the head of a tax collector. He doesn't argue. Zacchaeus, do you know my, my viewpoint on taxation? Do you know my viewpoint on this? And no, he doesn't. What does he say? He goes, Zacchaeus, come down. You're coming to dinner with me. You're coming to dinner with me. And I think that's our posture to have in this. Instead of beating him over with what we know from the scriptures, it's come to dinner with me. Let me take you out. Let's talk about this. You know, let's just, let me get to know you. Let me hear your story. A lot of times when you put a face behind this issue, things change. Things change and you really sense the heart that God has for ignored group of people. Let's pray. Father, uh, as we close our time here, I know, God, it can be, long and I know we've dug into a lot of stuff here and maybe this is something that we watch again or or dig in ourselves God but I pray one that you would guide us Holy Spirit in this one let us be a church that doesn't ignore the truth God but engages with the scriptures with this God and is able to articulate it and at the same time can we be mercy and truth as Jesus was God can we not bring and clobber and, and hurt God, a group of people that is already assuming that we hate them. God, can we be loving like Jesus was? Can we take him to dinner? Can we just be that? And I know that's hard, but Holy Spirit, when you're involved, things change all the time. So help us with this. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for watching our service and being a part of this. I personally hope, and all of us from Jubilee Fellowship Church, Hope that God connected in your life and met you right where you are this weekend in this service. Like I said at the beginning, just because you're watching online does not mean that you're not part of the whole of the community of what our church is doing. And we are so grateful that you're a part of this. So before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel and we hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.